I'm Liz McClarnon, former member of Atomic Kitten. I've grown up in the public eye, but there's a very private side to me you might not know. Do you know what? I don't even remember telling anyone about that one. I've been stalked. That is so horrible. And it's had a huge impact on every aspect of my life. I felt violated, really. But I'm not the only one. A staggering one in five women and one in ten men will experience stalking at some point in their life. It goes on and on and on. And no matter how many times I say no, it's almost like he hears yes. And for some, it will have devastating consequences. It's a very dangerous situation. And obviously my sister paid the ultimate price. I want to share my story to raise awareness of a problem that's just not been taken seriously enough. The response has been, oh, you know, aren't you feeling flattered that someone you know likes you that much? But confronting just how serious stalking can be isn't going to be easy. God, it's so scary. I mean, what is worse? There is nothing else, and we've seen that today. I was just 17 when I joined Atomic Kitten. Bit of oil. Since then, I've been lucky enough to make a career in the entertainment industry. It's a lot of onion. But away from the spotlight, I'm a home bird at heart. I absolutely love cooking. I absolutely love it. It's like therapy for me. Food in the McLaren family is up there with everything. Food and football, that's, a, that's pretty much how it goes. That's probably joint first, food and football. But three years ago, my home life changed forever. I started to receive messages from a fan online. Messages that became so violent and so sexual, I was terrified for my own safety. I don't think anyone understands how scary it can be. You know, if, if you've got a letter in the post that said, I am going to do this to you, and it's going to be like this, and this is exactly what will happen, you'll be petrified because it's real, it's in your hand, it's there. But online, people think that that's not as real, whereas actually the words are exactly the same. And the words I was being sent were so graphic that I struggled to talk to anyone about them, even those closest to me. My family still live in Liverpool, and I try to escape home as much as possible. And there's always one subject that takes my mind off things. We are a huge football family. Both sides of the family are Evertonians, like staunch, staunch Evertonians. I've always kind of had to love football, really, because if you want to talk to any of the men in my family, learn the offside rule, definitely, from a young age. <laughs> Coming home always reminds me of my time before Atomic Kitten. So I brought my little brother Joe back to our old neighbourhood. It does look the same, doesn't it? it? Hasn't changed at all. This is the house we lived in just before I joined the band. <laughs> oh my God, it is so different. This was all grass, wasn't it? All of it, the whole garden. And the you know what I used to do? I used to come out here to be on the phone to my first yeah. boyfriend. I was like, yeah, I miss oh. you too. Oh. Where are you? Mm. I'll see you tomorrow. That's not something a brother wants to hear. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not rude conversations, just normal. Just like, you know, 16-year-old, like, I think that. I love you. Okay. <laughs> Aww. I want to be 16 again. <laughs> At 16, a lot of my time was spent in my bedroom. And I'm desperate to see it before I go. Oh, my God. Wow. This is so weird. Oh, my God. This whole room was covered with boys' own posters. I thought they were just the best thing ever. I loved Ronan, and my best friend, Amy, loved Stephen. I used to call her Mrs. Gately, and she used to call me Mrs. Mrs. Keating. Honestly, we loved them. Teenage crushes aside, there is a serious reason why I'm back in Liverpool. So I'm popping round for a chat with my mum. Hmm. 
I left home at 17 to join the band, but I never stopped relying on my mum. Oh, the beginning of Atomic Kitten. God, I was like 17, yeah, 17, 18. Remember when you used to come home with all your stuff? All the washing. All the washing. Literally about four casings, wasn't it? No. But it's funny that even when Kerry and I lived together, you used to bring all the shopping around. You also used to buy everything. Like, all, all your wages went on our shopping. I know. And you were so hungry, all weren't you? Time. You and Kerry would dive on the bags, wouldn't they? Waiting at the window yeah. for me to come, because you knew what time I finished with. Is it, Mum? Is it, Mum? <laughs> and then you go, kiss, please. <laughs> you go, Sorry, hi, Mum. <laughs> Mum worked as a counsellor when I was growing up, so has always been on hand with good advice. Do you remember when you first told me about you having trouble with someone online? No, I don't know. When did I? When did I? You didn't actually tell me much at first, did you? Mm. you? Just seemed to gloss over it at first. Yeah, I'm still doing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I just didn't want to. I've been. I just. I've not gone into detail with anyone really. That I feel. I feel like I'm being a bit OTT about it. Do you? Yeah, I feel like I'm being... Am, am I being too dramatic? Uh, well, I think quite the reverse, really. I don't think you've dealt with it at all, hardly. Mm. I honestly think you've shelved it. I, uh, one thing I do think about doing this programme is that I think it will help you see that you're not being OTT. Mm. I do worry about the effect it's going to have on you. I do worry that facing it is going to be a little bit difficult. I just worry about that side of it for you. It's going to come home to you how serious it is, because it is mm. a serious issue. But all in all, is it a good thing for me to do? It's it's spectacular to do. Finish it with a bit of comedy, you see. <laughs> Can't leave yet. it on the low. <laughs> With Mum's support, I'm ready to continue on my journey. So I've come back to London to tackle my harassment head on. It's difficult to grasp just how upsetting online abuse can be if you haven't experienced it. So to help people understand, I'm going to read out some of the messages I received. Okay, so I'm going to have a look now. I remember this one, actually, because I'd said I had a great night last night. You know, like, pretty general, that, isn't it, really? And then someone, and he put, yeah, our sex session was very enjoyable. There's a couple in a row here. Just a, about what I should wear and what he's fantasising about and what he's doing to himself. I forgot how bad they were. Do you know what? I don't even remember telling anyone about that one. Probably because it's bad. That is horrible. That is so horrible. You can't say that to people. I don't know this person. Facing up to how the messages have made me feel has been more painful than I ever imagined. No, don't. Don't want to do that anymore. No. And it's made me question whether I want to continue on this journey at all. Honestly, uh, you know, I may as well answer honestly, no, don't want to. I think it's important to. No, I don't at all. Wholeheartedly, no. I'm Liz McLarnan, and I've been stalked. Despite how painful it is to talk about, I'm hoping that sharing my story will help others in a similar situation. Now I want to find out what other people have experienced online and whether it can shed any light on what I've been through. There's a whole generation of young people that have grown up online would they find the messages I've received unusual? 
I'm very open to the fact that if they say, you know, well, we're fine with it and, you know, you need to pull your socks up and, you know, have a sip of a lift about it, then, then I'm open to that, I'm fine with that, really. To find out, I've come to a university in Bedfordshire to chat to some students. Hey everyone, I'm Liz, nice to meet you. Hi. You alright? Nice Unsurprisingly, sharing and swapping information online seems standard. My friend the other day came in, she goes, oh, I'm dating a new guy, I'm going out on a first date, comes running in, all excited. <laughs> and out. she's like, right, let's have a Facebook perm. Like, and it's all completely innocent, so we'll go through like all the pictures. Be like, oh, he's nice. Or else she'll be like, oh, I'm not sure. Th that's pretty innocent, though, isn't it? I mean, of that's course, yeah. Like, that's like your friend's checking out. You know, have you got but while they're happy to joke about a little sneaky snooping, it seems they're not comfortable with everything that goes on online. I've had people approach me like when I've been on a night out and stuff and they'd say, oh yeah, I knew you were coming to Liquid tonight like I saw it on your Facebook. And I'm like, what? You, and it really scares me. But there's one story that's particularly upsetting. For the last six months, 20-year-old Esther has been receiving messages and texts from a boy she barely knows. What, and what kind of text messages do you get? Um, it's not the normal, hello, how are you? It, X-rated sort of thing, something you would not want to get, something you would not want to read, something you do not want anyone to read, because when people read it, they think, oh, Esther, what are you doing with this person? Because you must have done something with him for him to send you messages like that. And I'm thinking, it's his imagination, it's not me. How does that make you feel when someone's sending you messages like that that you quite clearly have not wanted and, and you, make, you make it clear that you don't want? Angry. It makes me really furious. I want to punch a, punch a wall. <laughs> but um, it's, I feel angry, I feel insecure. Worried how they might react, Esther hasn't told her parents about the messages, but her friends don't seem to be taking it seriously. I feel like they, they think it's a joke. They don't really get it that I'm upset about it because I really am. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And no matter how many times I say no, it's almost like he hears yes. Esther is getting help with the trouble she's having online. But I'm shocked at the level of harassment she's experienced. I had no idea the problem was quite so bad. Talking to the students today has actually, for the first time, given me the feeling that I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to, you know, it spared me on. Um, I'm going to raise more awareness and um, it could even help them. Chatting to Esther has reminded me of how I felt when I first started getting messages. So I've come back to the London flat I lived in where it all began. living here because it was sort of the first place that I began to be um, more domesticated you know after years of traveling around hotels constantly living here was where I actually I became to be more of a domestic goddess if you will but um, looking at it now I don't remember most of that I remember bad feelings really my abuse started three years ago just after I joined Twitter a fan started posting extreme sexual messages on my newsfeed. And they were impossible to ignore. I felt violated, really, because it was uh, it puts mental images in your head and, and I, it made me feel extremely uncomfortable. No matter how many times I blocked him, he continued to post more messages under different usernames. And with access to my account on my mobile, I could never escape them. I did lose a few phones against the wall. <laughs> I did, just because I was just like, well, if I get rid of the phone, then I won't have to look at it. Eventually, the abuse got so bad that it started to have a huge impact on my life, emotionally and physically. I couldn't even get undressed without thinking of the disgusting things that had been said. And it made relationships almost impossible. 
You know, I didn't want to even have an arm around me, let alone anything else. I just didn't want to be touched. Didn't want to be touched, didn't want to anyone to come near me. I reported my abuse to the police last year and it's currently being investigated. But I want to know if other people have been affected as much as I have. So I've come to Portsmouth to find out. I've never spoken to anyone that suffered prolonged cyber stalking like me. So I've come to meet Elle, who was stalked for five years. Oh, thank you very much. I'd love to. In 2005, Elle was a singer with a promising career in the music industry. But while chatting to fans online, she started receiving abusive messages. I used to get death threats on a daily basis. At the most, it was about 20 to 30 messages a day, of death threats a day telling me they was going to send a hitman to my house, um, that they was going to slit my throat. Um, yeah, very, very detrimental stuff. And, and they also focused a lot on, on what I was trying to achieve with my music, saying that I was talentless, that I was ugly, that I didn't deserve to be alive, that I didn't deserve a music career. I mean, I got to a point where I, I couldn't bear looking at myself. I couldn't bear hearing my voice. I couldn't bear anything about me because I started to believe what this person was saying to me. That's really sad, isn't, isn't it? Because your whole life changes then. Yeah. It almost became something the effect of online abuse is often underestimated. Far from being just words on a screen, it can actually cause deep psychological scars. Elle's abuse affected her so badly that she felt unable to continue with her music. Since I was very young, my main dream was to get on a stage and actually sing because music was a huge part of my life. And I really, I really wanted to, I really wanted to make something of myself. And, you know, I just wanted to perform. It's just something that I love doing. Elle has never returned to her music. Despite her truly terrifying ordeal, she received little help from the police. And it was only down to her own detective work that her stalker was even traced. In 2009, after five years of aggressive abuse, a woman was arrested. A woman Elle had never even met. It's been two years since Elle's abuse, and with the help of friends and family, she's gradually building back her confidence. She's now working with charities to support others in a similar situation. What's life like now since the stalking? Do you feel like you've come to terms with it now, Elle? I have come to terms with it because I, I realise now that it wasn't my fault. Yeah, I didn't deal with it in great ways before, and maybe I shut myself away. My advice to anyone who goes through this is there is light at the end of the tunnel. You can come through it. And I'm trying to turn a negative into a positive now. I think that really helps me. It's, it's like therapy to me, actually. Yeah. It's definitely nice to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. There definitely is. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still deep in the tunnel, definitely. I am. Um, um, but it's nice to know that there is an end result to it. And, you know, I'm not there, but... You will come out the other side, though. You will come out the other side. Elle has turned a horrific experience into something very inspiring. But I can't understand why she wasn't given more help to stop her abuse in the first place. Elle having to give up her career because of this cyber stalking is absolutely horrendous. I get so angry. I mean, I, I could honestly, I could, I could swear. It's made me realise just how important it is to highlight the devastating impact stalking can have. But I had no idea it would take me to such a dark place. It's weird because it's opening a door to the world of cyber stalking. I don't think I want to know about everything else. Oh my God, it sounds so selfish. 
but it kind of just like closed the door, lock it with a massive key <laughs> and bury it somewhere. I'm confronting the stalking I've experienced to try to raise awareness of just how distressing it can be. I know that to understand my own ordeal fully, there's someone in a very similar situation I need to speak to. So I've come to Manchester to meet Lauren. Lauren, are you babe? Hiya. You all right? No. Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. You all fine? Oh, thank you very much, thank <laughs> you. Do you want a cover? Yeah, come on then. Whoa. 22 year old Lauren has been a loyal fan of Atomic Kitten since she was a teen. So over the years, I've watched her grow up. First time I seen you, it wasn't a gig, it was a signing. Was it? Yeah, in Virgin. In Liverpool? Yeah. <laughs> I think it... I don't know if it was Eternal Flame or a book. Oh, really? A book? Yeah. Did we even have a book? Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was. How old were you then? Oh, 12, 13. Oh, my God. 18. <laughs> Unfortunately, Lauren and I have more than just the band in common. For the past two years, Lauren has also been cyber-stalked by the same person that has harassed me. She's also been sent extreme sexual messages, and I want to know how it's affected her. How did it make you feel when he started sending you those really, really bad things? At first, it was like I would get really upset, and it would make me feel sick. It was disgusting. It, it embarrassed me as well, though. And then, like, every time I get one, I just I felt so angry. I, I, I'm really, really angry. But it just, especially if you got it in the morning, it would just completely ruin the whole day. Like, the whole day you'd be thinking about it. Yeah. But then if you got it at night, you couldn't sleep. I know. Lauren met our stalker on a fan website, and she's one of several others that he's targeted. See, I'm starting to get, like... Cos I can see how, like, upset you are about it, and I'm starting to get upset, you know, because it makes me feel really uncomfortable. Because you were very young when you first met him. And that's the only reason I went to the police, because it was like, this has got... This is to do with other people that are a lot younger than me that I can't let this happen to. He is clever in the fact that... he waited. So it was like, he knew what he was doing. So... he knew to wait until you were a certain age yeah. to say rude things? Yeah. Right? God, it, you know what, it gets, I'm just, I'm sorry to get like this to you, babe, but it just gets, I'm really sorry about the whole thing. It's not your fault. But I feel that it is, so I feel like I have to say that I am really sorry. Sorry that it was anything to do with us, Atomic Kitten, or, and me. It's really not your fault, though. I know, I'll come here. No. Mm. No. You all right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I know, I know, I'm all right. <laughs> Lauren has been really brave to speak out about her experiences. But I want our chat to end on a positive note. So it's time to cheer us both up. Lauren, we could um, reenact the Atomic Kitten video. <laughs> 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 the Atomic Kitten video, remember we were all the first one? <laughs> oh my god, is that what it will look like? John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can't do a John Lennon accent. How can you not do a John Lennon accent? He's a scouser. Because <laughs> it's, it's different, it's different, isn't it? Like that. Talking to Lauren has brought back lots of happy memories of my time in Atomic Kitten. The band split up in 2004, but I carried on as a solo artist. Sadly, not all of the memories of that time are quite so good. In 2006, I released my first solo single. And I came to this music store to meet fans and sign records. So I think that... Um... As far as I remember, I was this way, with a desk here. None of this was here, I was on a desk. And then um, everyone was queuing up right round their shelves. 
and it was a lovely day. It was absolutely lovely, you know, like all the fans came from really far away and it was really sweet. I, I can quite easily block the other bit out. Meeting fans has always been one of my favorite parts of the job. But on that day, I had no idea who was lurking in the crowd. Last year, my stalker sent me a message I will never forget. Not only had he been here at this signing, he had had his picture taken with me and had even made physical contact. I had come face to face with my stalker. When I first saw the picture and I first realized that I had met him, initially I got very upset. I met that person. I spoke to him, I was very nice to him. And I hate, hate that he, we got a picture and he had his arm around me. It's the idea that he was, what was he thinking when he was here? That's what's making me uncomfortable. Because I just think, were well, you thinking the things that you've said to me? And knowing that he's actually had physical contact makes me feel sick, so sick. Finding out I'd met my stalker changed everything for me. Moving my abuse out of the online world and into my very real world. I can't imagine what it must be like to deal with that every day. I think it would be the most terrifying thing in the world if you actually were face to face with a stalker every day. That must be the most scary thing. No wonder people end up locking themselves in their houses and not doing anything. In, in life, that's one of my biggest fears. I want to understand just how frightening being stalked in person can actually get. So a few days later, I've come to Bolton to meet Sarah, whose sister was stalked by her ex-partner. Sarah doesn't want to film at home, so I've arranged to meet her in a nearby guest house. Hey, Sarah. Nice, nice to, to meet you. Mm. Congratulations. Thank you. How far gone are you? First two weeks. Oh, Not long left. Absolutely lovely. At 24, Sarah's sister Katie was a devoted mum and big sister. She was fun, energetic. Um, she was always there for me when I was growing up. We'd always hang about together. It was big sister and little sister always together. She'd always do my hair, just girly things that sisters do. Katie had been involved in an abusive relationship for eight years, but when they broke up, her ex-partner started stalking her. He would constantly be turning up at the house, um, he would tap on the window late at night, trying to get her attention. He had been sleeping in the her back garden. He managed to steal a spare set of keys, gain entry to her house. He slept on the couch and snuck upstairs and took a phone from under a pillar. Despite police involvement, over the three months following their split, the stalking intensified. I remember being on the phone to her one night because he was hanging about the house. She could see him in the corner of the, at the side of the house and things like that. A terror in her voice. The, the, you could tell in her voice how scared she was. And on the 9th of October 2008, things came to a head. I spoke to her, I think it was about 23 minutes past 8 in the morning. And it was strange because she was so happy. She got the kids the breakfast and... I was on the phone to her and she was also doing the washing and that's when um, she said to me, I've got to go because I'm struggling to end the washing out. I just wish I'd have, I'd have done something different on that morning. I stayed on the phone a little bit longer, I'd have heard him turn up, gone to a house before going to the doctor's, gone down a different street, I'd have seen him go into his mum's and I'd have thought something of it. Around 40% of stalking is carried out by an ex-partner. But because there has been a relationship with the victim, it's not always taken as seriously as it should be.
Sarah wants to show me where most of Katie's stalking took place. So she's brought me to the house where her sister used to live. Obviously, down here is the other way to the back of the house, which will explain a bit where he used to go to stalk her without anyone being aware of what he was up to. You can see, if you're walking down here at night, it's pitch black, he could hide, nobody would know he was here. Just after Sarah spoke to her sister on that day in 2008, Katie's ex-partner turned up at her house. There was an argument, and he followed her inside. She was hanging at the washing in the back garden, and then um, just around the side there is where he followed her in. And that, that's when he stabbed her and continued to stab her until she died. And it's... It's very... Katie was just 24 when she was killed. Leaving four children and a grieving family. Her ex-partner was sentenced to 20 years in prison. But for Sarah and her family, their loss will last a lifetime. What would you say to someone who is currently being stalked? They've got to realise that it's a very dangerous situation and there is consequences that will follow. And obviously my sister paid the ultimate price with her uh, in her situation, so I just encourage people to just speak out about it, really, and get help. Tragically, Katie's story is not as extreme as it might seem. A staggering 76% of women murdered by their ex-partners are stalked leading up to their death. I cannot express the importance of being here today with Sarah, of, of making more people aware of it. I just, God, it's so scary. I mean, you know, you know what, what is worse than someone being killed? There is nothing else, and we've seen that today. Spending the day with Sarah has taught me a horrific lesson in the dangers of stalking. Just a few weeks ago, I was joking with students about checking out friends online, and I've just left the scene of a horrific murder. We all need to wake up to just how serious stalking can be. To understand the problem fully, I need to know what drives someone to stalk in the first place. So I've come to meet Emma Short, psychologist and cyber stalking expert. So Emma, what drives someone to stalk? Who, what type of person stalks? This is really no simple answer. You know, our, our classic understanding, I suppose, is someone who is out to frighten you, to terrify you, who perhaps gets, you know, a sexual kick from doing those things. Then, you know, there are ex-partners who may not accept a relationship is over and want to reinstate it. Then you've got people who perhaps got mental health problems who really, truly believe that the person they are stalking will love them back. Have you, in your line of work, heard any stories about what's happened when someone's gone to report stalking? Oh, yeah. There are some good cases, you know, where people have really good results, and there are also ones that just make you want to cry. And things that are just so unhelpful, you know, Everyone would like a stalker, you know, aren't you feeling flattered that someone, you know, likes you that much? And send people away thinking, there is nothing I can do about this. I am completely on my own. This will be, this will be the rest of my life. So what do you think needs to be done to A, protect victims and B, to prosecute more stalkers? It has to be taken more seriously. And that's, you know, the general public, victims of stalking, as well as the police. So if you are experiencing fear and you are being intruding upon in a way that frightens you you know that that's a crime and people around you need to understand that that's abuse it's criminal abuse and not just to laugh and joke about it which so often happens up until recently stalking in itself wasn't considered a crime so it was difficult to prosecute new laws have been passed to tackle this but our attitude towards stalking still needs to change. How many more 
people have to be victimised? How many more people have to lose their lives before we start taking this seriously? I'm done learning about it now. I want to do something about it. I, I basically, I want to take action. I've spent the last few weeks delving into the world of stalking. What I've learned has opened my eyes to just how devastating it can be. And I want to help make other people more aware of it. I know the problem can't be fixed overnight, but I'm hoping to make a difference to one person I've met along the way. Hello. Hi Elle, it's Liz McClarnan. Hi Liz, Hi. how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm doing all right, thank you, yeah. Good, good. Um, listen, I just wanted to suggest something to you. Elle's confidence was affected so badly by her stalking that she gave up her dream career in music. But I want to help her take a baby step back into it. So I've arranged for us to record a song together in a studio to see if we can finally put her abuse to bed. I'm in recording studio one today. Studio one. first. Cool. Thank you. Bye. I hope Elle realises that the stalking she's been through and the music don't go hand in hand. I think that's a really, really important thing. Hey, missus. Yeah. How, How are you? you? I'm really good, thank you. Oh, it's Come lovely here. to see you again. You too. Mwah. Mwah. Lovely. Thank you, so do you. Yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm a little bit nervous. Oh, yeah? Yeah, well, it's, it's been ages since I've been in the studio, so it's, it's like a big bridge I'm crossing, which I've not done in such a long time. So yeah. I'm nervous, but I'm excited too. OK, then. Do you want to get cracking? Yep. OK. Let's get cracking. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. Hi. Fine, thanks. How are you? This will be a huge challenge for Elle. Oh, my God. It's been three years since she's oh, even nice. stepped foot in a studio. It's been a long time since I've looked at one of these microphones. And I'm hoping it won't prove too much. You know what, you look a bit nervous. I Not know. nervous, but like kind of a bit... <sighs> yeah, I, I'm trying not to have a breakdown at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, I'll get through it, I will. Thank you. No problem. With the studio set, it's time for a run through. Okay, let's have a little practice. God. Okay. But Al gets off to a shaky start. From this day on, stepping into the future. It seems her nerves are getting the better of her. I can't hear anything. I can't hear myself at all. It's quite loud. To calm her down, I run her through the song without the music. Every day gets better. Wouldn't want to change a single I love it that you're helping me. Brilliant. You know it. <laughs> I haven't lit it. <laughs> and it's not long before she's ready to go for a take. Let's have another go then. Here we go. And before long, she's back into the swing of it. Oh, now I'm feeling stronger every day. Look into the mirror. Yeah. Smile at the girl. It's almost like the years of abuse never happened. With the track in the bag, it's time for a celebration. I cannot express how well it went today. After hearing Elle's story, it put me in such a, a sad place for her that doing this today just really turned the tables and I just think she seems like a different person so it just makes me think, wow, God, you can get over these things, you really can with time and with a bit of singing, in Elle's case. <laughs> Cheers, darling. Elle finally seems to have drawn a line under her stalking. 
but I want to help prevent others suffering so badly in the first place. So I've come back to the university in Bedfordshire. They're holding a stalking awareness day for the students. We're doing this big event to raise awareness and equip you with tools and knowledge how to protect yourself online. And there's someone I'm desperate to catch up with. Hello. Hey. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. How have you been? I haven't seen you. What's been going on? Oh, a lot's been the last on. time I spoke to Esther, she was struggling to cope with the stalking she was experiencing. Since that last time, I actually spoke to my parents about it. Oh, how did that go? <laughs> my mum freaked out <laughs> a lot um, more than I did. I bet you she did. What did she say? Um, she said, oh, we need, to tell, uh, we need to tell this person, we need to tell that person, we need to call the SWAT team. <laughs> that cracks me Aww. up. <laughs> so she meant the police then? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think she actually did mean the SWAT team. <laughs> well, she's protective though, isn't she? She is. They've been really supportive. And um, I know I was scared at first to tell them, but it was really good. The university have arranged for speakers to share their experiences of stalking. And some familiar faces have agreed to take part. But I'm here to share my story too. I'm really nervous about doing this speech actually because, um, I, I, you know, I've got to really open up in it. So I'd much rather just stand up there and sing for them. If they want that, I'd rather do that. But um, you know what? I'm going to do it because I've got to do it. All I hope is that with this speech, I just help some of the students, even if it's just one. That's, you know, I'll be happy. Around 12% of female students are likely to be stalked, but the number could be much higher. Because like Esther, not all of them report it. And I want to help change that. OK, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Farnan, who very wonderfully agreed to come and speak today about her experiences. So, welcome to the news. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Clarnan, and um, I'm very nervous. So, um, you know, bear with me. About three years ago, I began to receive messages on a social networking site. Despite how difficult it is, standing in front of these students makes me realise just how far I've come on my journey. When I started, I could barely even read the messages I'd been sent. And now I'm sharing my story with complete strangers. I found it difficult to speak to friends and family about what I've been through. The last few weeks have taught me just how important it is to speak out, get help and take action. I began to wonder whether it was me making too much of a big deal of it. And the people I've met along the way have inspired me to pass those lessons on that harassment of any kind, either online or in person, is not acceptable. If it feels wrong or uncomfortable, then you shouldn't have to put up with it. Thank you for listening. I hope that was a bit interesting for you. Thanks. Now I'll sing. <laughs> As the students leave their feedback, it seems the event has struck a chord. It was a great end to a really, really hard time. It was very special for me to see so many people that I've met along the way because it felt like we'd come together for a positive reason, for a special cause, and almost drawing a line under all of our experiences. And then um, it was lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. <laughs> see you though. See ya. This journey for me has been harder than I ever imagined it would be. To be frank, at times, I just did want to give up, but I didn't. And now, I feel like I've put an end to the torment in my head, but I feel like I've started another journey with other people to fight against it and to help others. So, actually, epic is the word. I, it does feel epic, you know. I feel I'm satisfied, I'm really satisfied.